Hey, welcome back to Glendo Reservoir here in Eastern Wyoming. You know, the first couple of videos I did last year were from this very spot. Um, there's some great Jurassic outcrops all around. Not only that, but it's a great lake to come to if you like boating, jet skiing, fishing, the usual. So I made a series of videos here walking through some of the cool geological features including this one. We're at a really interesting moment in geological time. We're in the middle Jurassic right here. And these lighter colored rocks behind me, these kind of laminated sandstones, that's the top of the lowermost part of the Sundance Formation. You might have heard of the Sundance Formation. There's a lot of marine fossils found in it. There's a lot of big ichthyosaurs. There's a lot of big pliosaurs. There's a lot of really cool ammonites, belemnites, and trace fossils. In this lower white part, which is locally called the Canyon Springs member, it's a transitional unit from windblown Aeolian dunes at the bottom all the way up into where we are here, which is a complex of tidal facies. There's tidal dunes, there's maybe some tidal flats, there's marine traces in this, there's chunks of shell, little bits of uh, gastropods and bivalve shells. But also you notice there's a really strong surface right there. And it goes from the light colored stuff below to the kind of golden, classic golden colored rocks that are all over the surface here. And I'm at Reno Cove here is one of my favorite spots ever to camp, to fish, to hang out. Because in this material above, it is absolutely chock full of beautiful marine trace fossils. Things like Rhizocorellium, things like Thalassinoides. There's all kinds of shell fragments even little starfish traces called Asterocytes. So there's a thriving marine fossil assemblage here, a little bit of an impoverished one here, but the key is there's a flooding surface. In other words, the sedimentary basin here was really inundated. It was tidal here, so there's maybe estuarine and brackish water, but up above, you got into the open offshore. And in fact, there's even some storm deposits. A lot of these sand bodies are storm deposits. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump in a boat, we're gonna go across the reservoir, and we're gonna take a look at some of these very same outcrops across the way. And I'll show you some of the really cool features, the traces, the sedimentology, and what they mean for the local environment. So let's jump in the boat, let's go, and I'll meet you out there. So a good chunk of the early Jurassic, it's gone. Probably because the Hartville uplift moved it got eroded off, or it was never deposited in the first place. But we're in a part now that's marine. And we know it's marine because there's some similarities to what we just saw in the goose egg. Like this. Some really nice ripples. Linear ripples. Again, they can form in lakes, rivers, reservoirs, oceans, bays, seas. Ripples aren't very diagnostic. But there's some other really exciting things I want to show you here besides these gorgeous ripples. And again, this is a state park. Don't collect anything. Take all the pictures you want. Do not collect anything. I warned you. So you remember the goose egg formation, I pointed out that there was a lack of marine trace fossils, even though there's a lot of nice ripples, nothing that indicated it was marine. Well, take a look at these. These are some absolutely spectacular rhizocorallium traces. They're made probably by polychaete worms. And so is this one. Once you start looking, you see these hues all over with the little sprita. Look at that. Ah, oh, the light is really nice now. So there's the U shape. There's the sprita. There's U's all over. Look at this. This entire surface is made up of nothing but U's of the rhizocorallium traces. But wait, there's more. Absolutely amazing rhizocorallium traces all over the place in here. Look at that. This was polychaete worm heaven back in the Jurassic. And they are marine animals. They do not like freshwater. They can tolerate some brackish, but man, the size of these guys suggests this is open marine conditions. This unit is absolutely incredible. It's about maybe uh, not quite a meter thick, not quite three feet thick, but it is absolutely positively 100% bioturbated by rhizocorallium. Everywhere you look, there's just U-tubes all over. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. This deposit must have sat here for a very, very long time while all these generations after generations of polychaete worms made their homes in it. So that's telling you a couple of things. That's telling you that number one, conditions were perfect for these guys. 
there's plenty of food, plenty of oxygen, good salinity. It's also telling you there was not a lot of sedimentation because if there was a lot of sedimentation, it would have been piling up on top of them. They would have had to have adjusted upward. These guys weren't adjusting anywhere. It was just burrow after burrow after burrow. Sedimentation did change above where you start getting that more planar laminated hummocky, rippled sandstone. So there's indication of storm deposits there. No storm deposits here, just piles of reworked sediment. That's pretty suggestive of shallowing upwards. So this is below the reach of storm waves. Once you start shallowing up just enough that storm waves can hit the bottom, blammo. That's where you get the hummocks. That's where you get the ripples. That's where everything changes. Here's a really nice three-dimensional expression of the paired tubes of the rhizocrallium. So you're looking at a bedding plane surface. Originally, it was oriented like that and it's flipped up, but you can see those two tubes going up and down. That's pretty cool. There's also tons of little bitty bivalves. Look at these little shells. Those are all teeny tiny little clam shells. So we've got bivalves, we've got polychaete burrows. My goodness, what else will we find? Well, we also have the most controversial sedimentary structure in the world. We have hummocky and swaley cross bedding. See how this bedding here kind of dips down and it gets thicker in the middle and then thinner on the ends. And then it creates a dome on the other side. That's called hummocky cross bedding. And it forms usually associated with big storm waves out below fair weather wave base. Now, typically hummocky cross bedding is very controversial because uh, in a core or an image log that's taken below surface, it's very difficult to tell if these beds are thinning or thickening over any distance because a core taken in the subsurface is generally about four inches wide. Um, I've had people refuse to talk to me because we look at a core and I interpret it as hummocky and the other person decided it wasn't. Um, a person I worked with, he wouldn't talk to me for six months afterwards. It's a controversial topic. Geologists are real nerds. But this is definitive hummocky and swaley cross bedding behind me in the Sundance Formation. And we're in the lower part of the Sundance in what's called the Stockade Beaver member. I don't know who comes up with these names, I really don't. But in the Stockade Beaver, we've got big rhizocorallium, we've got hummocky cross bedding, we've got all kinds of other stuff indicating we're in open marine conditions. Very different than what we saw in the goose egg. We'll see if that trend continues higher up in the Jurassic. We know it's going to change at some point, but at what point is that? We'll find out. I'm just looking some more at these hummocky and swaley beds. Uh, some of them have even higher angle bedding to them. You know, it's worth talking about how they form just a little bit more. Um, during a big storm, large waves create an orbital. And that orbital is essentially a circular flow of water. How deep do they go? Well, that's a fun mathematical calculation you can impress your friends with. Generally, a storm wave's orbital decreases in size as you go down the water column proportional to the width of the storm wave, the wavelength. So if the wavelength from crest to crest in a storm wave is, let's say, 100 feet, it will go down about 50 feet. So it's about half the wavelength. So if you're seeing hummocky beds in water, let's say, 30 feet deep, that tells you the storm waves were 60 foot crest to crest. Now, we don't know how deep it was here. Generally, and here's another controversial topic, generally storm waves in the world today are about 10 to 15 meters deep. Yes, it depends on a whole lot of variables. You can find them shallower. You can find them deeper. You can find exceptions to the rule, to any rule in the world. But generally, 80, 90% of the time, which is pretty good, you're looking at about 10 to 15 meters. So about 35, 40, 45, 50 feet. So 35 to 50 feet, let's say. Taking that as a broad estimate, understanding there's slop on either side of it, we can maybe guess that these are probably around 50 feet of water. Now again, people wanna argue that because that's what geologists do, we love arguing. Uh, none of us was here when this happened, so we can't really prove it or disprove it. Um, and at some point you just go, all right, let's move on. But for now, we can say that generally, we can assume, roughly, we're in about 50 feet of water here, maybe a little bit deeper, where the rhizocorallums have totally chewed up the bedding. Incidentally, there are still rhizos here, and there's still other traces as well. So we're still in a nice marine setting. 
plenty of circulation, plenty of food. Wow, so that's a lot from this one outcrop. We'll keep working our way south, which is up section, and see where we wind up. So let's just walk around and look at this cool little thing I found, this little plug-shaped burrow. This is the orientation it was in life. Here's what it looks like from underside. Um, it sort of looks like an anemone print. Burrowing anemones stick their little tushies down in the sediment and create something called Bergeria. Uh, but this one's asymmetrical. It's a little bit weird. So it's maybe not an anemone as we would think of one. Maybe it was something else. Could have been a bivalve, but it's not a rhizocorallium. It's not a polychaete. So it's something else living on the surface. Maybe an anemone. Uh, could have been a big gastropod burrowing in, but there's something else here. And again, common in marine environments, not common in lacustrine. That's why we didn't see any in the goose egg. This is a cool rock because it shows not just rhizocorallium, and there's little bitty ones in addition to the big ones. Look at these little guys, they're cute. But oh, look at this big Y-shaped burrow. Uh, look at this one here, there's another one. That's something different. And this one almost has little nobbles on it. You can almost see it's got little indentations and it continues. Those guys are pretty common on this surface and they're called thalassinoides. If those nobbles were a little bit better developed, you'd call it Ophiomorpha. They're made by thalassinidian shrimp. So this surface has shrimp burrows and small rhizocorallium. So the environment at the time of deposition of this bed was different than the environment at the time of deposition of the heavily bioturbated rhizocorallium bed. It was more optimal for the shrimp, maybe a little bit less optimal for the rhizocorallians or the polychaetes that made them. So even in this short little section of rock, we can see changes in the environment just enough to affect who's burrowing and who's doing what in the sediment. Wow, how about that? This is really cool too. A beautiful rippled surface like we saw in the goose egg and like we'll see in other formations, but chock full of rhizocorallium. So the polychaetes came from sediment above and went down into this rock or into the sand and left their mark on previously deposited ripples. Wow, very, very cool. So we're back safe and sound here at Reno Cove and all around me is that golden face. He's chock full of rhizocorallium, thalassinoides, hummocky crossbedding, ripples, swaley crossbedding, you name it. It's just everywhere. Surface is completely chock-a-block with trace fossils, ripples, structures, really awesome features. So that's why looking at this part of the Sundance Formation, we can be fairly confident that it's a storm-dominated open marine system that's a periodically getting a lot of sand washed in during these big storms. It grabs sand off the nearby shallow marine shelf system, transports it out into the basin, dumps it out, and it serves as a great opportunity for these organisms to colonize it and just really root through it and get all the nutrients out. Rhizocorallium and thalassinoides are deposit feeding animals. So they love eating that stuff from the sediment as they probe their way through. Um, Calian acid shrimp eat debris off the surface of the sediment. Rhizocorallium might be eating it from inside the sediment and dwelling in there and eating stuff from the surface. All kinds of interesting stuff you can tell from just looking at some of these trace fossils. That doesn't even address those tiny little bivalve shells. The tiny little bivalves are all over here too. So, you know, if you've been to places like the Northeast where I think they call them jingle shells, um, you find a lot of little bivalves in offshore environments and near shore uh, storm dominated environments. So these little guys were quite happy too. Interesting set of observations we made. So again, just to summarize, this is the stockade beaver member. It sits on top of some tidal deposits and it represents the first truly open marine system in the Sundance Formation. It's got sediments typical of offshore. It's got trace fossils typical of offshore. And that's kind of cool. So further up in the section, there's a lot of different sediments that represent differences in sea level, which might be related to things like climate. Uh, that can be when hot climate causes surface waters to expand, sea level rises. Cold climate causes surface levels to contract and that causes sea level to fall. You might have glaciation as well, which of course can also make sea level fall. Um, and there's tectonics at play. 
So there's a lot happening here in the Jurassic. Next time you're at Glendo or anywhere else, take a look at some of the rocks. They tell a really interesting story. If you can identify a couple of trace fossils and if you can identify a couple of sedimentary structures, hey, you're on your way to making a really interesting story out of rocks that 99 out of 100 people are just gonna walk by, not even give a second thought to, unless they're using them to hold down their tents, which a lot of people do here. And that's cool too. Maybe make fire rings. That's not so cool. But hey, whatever floats your boat. Speaking of which, I'm gonna get back to fishing out here because it's been really great for walleye. Thank you very much for watching. I appreciate it. And stay tuned for some more videos looking at the rocks around Glendo and other places. Take care and get outside, look at rocks, make friends with them. You'll be glad you did. Bye.